John. <laughs> I'm John Haig. Yeah. <laughs> I co-direct the most of our Romani Center for Business and Government. Um, <laughs> and we have with us a number of people. I'm not going to, I'm going to, Aparna um, um, is going to introduce um, the group. Um, and Aparna Mathar is, is basically, was a former senior fellow in the center. Uh, she is now a senior research manager in economics at Amazon. She was um, also at the Council of Economic um, Advisors, and particularly during the time of COVID and working on the COVID response. So this is a particularly timely topic in that regard. Um, she will introduce all, the, all of our panelists. The only one that I kind of have to mention is it's so good to have a former Kennedy School <laughs> PhD, David Autor, now at MIT, back, back, back uh, at the school. Always a pleasure to be here. <laughs> <laughs> but with that, Aparna, it's all yours. Thank you so much, John, and thanks everyone for being here. As uh, John mentioned, uh, my name is Aparna Mathur. I'm an alumni of the Senior Fellows Program at the Musawar Rahmani Center here at HKS. And during my time here, which was immediately after uh, my senior year as an economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors, I came to HKS. And I started a research project looking at government spending programs during the pandemic, which the CA was heavily involved in. I joined um, the White House in March 2020, uh, spent a year there, and saw sort of at the front end of how you know policy making happens. How do you think about relief programs? How do you design government programs to support a once in a lifetime uh, you know pandemic? And how do you think about you know, ways to change, what, you know, figure out what worked, what didn't, and how do you think about the future, right? If, if something happens again of the same magnitude and scale, would we do what we did before or would we just do something different? Um, and today we are in particular going to look at the types of supports that were implemented for small businesses and workers. These included prominently the $800 billion Paycheck Protection Program. I had David and Glenn Hubbard last year you know, also talk about uh, the pros and cons of how we how we did that uh, policy. But I want to extend the discussion today to also look at other small business supports like the employee retention tax credit, um, the um, uh, unemployment insurance programs, you know, the interactions between these different policies, because at the end of the day, you know, the idea is let's support businesses, let's support workers. Uh, but, you know, government came at it in, in many, many different ways. So I've always been curious about how do we think about these programs post pandemic? And this is not a criticism of how, you know, how we did it then. Obviously, policies were implemented really, really quickly. Uh, I don't think people had enough of an opportunity to sit back and say, here's how I designed the best, you know, thing that, that I want to implement. So, but I, but I think it's useful to sort of take that time now to take a breath and say, let's look back, you know, and think about what worked well, what didn't, and how would we change it? Um, another thing that we, you know, we're going to talk about is in, in the current moment, we're hearing a lot of stories about fraud related to you know, many of these programs. And so how do we put that in context, right? Uh, context of, yes, we're balancing, sending out support immediately. Uh, that is probably less well targeted than we want, um, but that also comes with its own costs. Um, so so, so we, we'll get into a lot of these interesting debates and discussions. I have a stellar panel, fortunately, to, to help me through the questions that, I, yeah, that I've come up with. So David, David Otter, is Ford Professor in the MIT Department of Economics, uh, co-director of the NBR Labor Studies Program, and, M and the MIT Shaping the Future of Work Initiative. His scholarship explores the labor market impacts of technological change and globalization on job polarization, skill demands, earnings levels, and inequality. The Economist magazine labeled Otter in 2019 as the academic voice of the American worker. But my favorite, later that same year, with equal justification, he was Christianed twerpy MIT economist by John <laughs> Oliver of Last Week Tonight in a segment on automation and employment. David, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Jacob Mortensen is an economist at the Joint Committee on Taxation, a nonpartisan group of economists, attorneys, and accountants that serve as Congress's in-house tax policy consultancy. As part of this work, he researches a variety of economic topics related to tax policy, including individual and corporate responses to income taxes, the impact of retirement saving subsidies, and the measurement of earnings, mobility, and inequality. So welcome, Jake. 
Julia, uh, uh, who is virtual, is an assistant professor of public economics in the Department of Social and Political Sciences at Bocconi University. She received a PhD in economics from the London School of Economics. She is also a research affiliate at CEPR and ISA, an international research fellow at the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and a research associate at the Center for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics. Uh, welcome, Julia. And thanks Thank for you very time. much, Apana. Thank you. And Ruth is a New York, Ruth Simon is a New York based reporter for the Wall Street Journal, where she covers small businesses and entrepreneurship. She has previously covered consumer lending, mortgages, and housing, and reported for Wall Street Journal's personal journal and money and investing sections. Ms. Simon won a 2019 Best in Business Award from the Society of American Business Editors and Writers for her coverage of the impact of the labor squeeze on small businesses. She was part of the Wall Street Journal team that received a 2021 New York Press Club Award for spot news coverage of the Paycheck Protection Program rollout. Welcome, Ruth, and we're excited to have you, um, especially you. to discuss you know, the topics we have with us today. So I wanted to start with some quick reactions to pandemic policy. Uh, you know, in the US, we, if you look at total spending, uh, we, we totaled about $4 trillion, I think, over two years, you know, and immediate about $2.5 trillion in the first few months of the pandemic. And if you compare that to the Great Recession, this was, what, four times or more of, you know, total uh, spending during that recession. So how do we think about, you know, what are the highlights, the lowlights, just at a high level, uh, you know, of what you saw come out of pandemic, the pandemic policy? Uh, and then, Julia, how does this compare globally? Uh, so I'm just going to open it up as a starting, you know, tell me what you thought when the programs were being rolled out in March 2020. What do you think about that today? Well, I mean, That's with David. I, I think, you know, the U.S. government could have chosen to support the unemployed. It could have chosen to support households. It could have chosen to support businesses and instead chose to support all three mm -hmm. uh, in programs that actually in some ways were overlapping and even competing. Mm -hmm. um, but the main thing is, you know, I think that the lesson that people took away from the 2008 recession is that the government, the stimulus was inadequate. Too little had been done, and we had an extremely slow, painful recovery, right? The, basically, the, the Great Recession that started in October 2007 didn't really end until about 2015. <clears throat> and so probably the government did a little too much, uh, and the Biden administration did either a little bit too much more. But uh, if you had to choose between those two alternatives, this was the right choice. And, yeah, and the U.S. has recovered rapidly, mm -hmm. much more rapidly than many other countries. And for a while, it looked like we chose all the wrong path. Now it all looks good. It's hard to know. We can't, we don't have all the counterfactuals, but uh, it, it was not a, uh, I, I think the investment was ultimately worth it. Yeah, the, the CARES Act really, you know, in retrospect, I think looks pretty good in, in the sense that, uh, as David mentioned, you know, policymakers kind of had the the choice of, of who to who to help in previous recessions they had done unemployment expansions they had done stimulus checks and, and they kind of knew how those programs worked and so it made sense that they reached for those tools in their tool bag when they started and and what they did is they just as david said made them much more generous and and so the the ppp was was kind of the real policy innovation of the cares act and uh, of the early responses to the pandemic, this trying to directly support businesses was not something that had been tried in, mm -hmm. in prior recessions. And, and so you're trying to do a new program. Was the magnitude correct on that? Yeah. that that's kind of a difficult question to, to answer. Uh, we're going to need a couple more of these to, <laughs> to maybe figure that out. Um, but you don't need a couple more pandemics. No, uh, <laughs> you know, for, for researchers, we, we need more variation. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to say what kind exactly, yeah. but. Um, Julia? Yes, thanks. So as you said before, I'm going to bring in a little bit more of an international perspective, and I would say more of a European one. Um, so I think, as David said, it's uh, it's true also in Europe that uh, countries tended to help firms, workers, and, and households. Probably what differed compared to the U.S., between Europe and the U.S., is the mix of different policies that have been used. 
Um, in Europe, in particular, we have been using job retention schemes at large, uh, whilst the US, I would say, relied a little bit more on more on unemployment insurance and, and wage subsidies. So um, I completely share the view that it's hard to evaluate the uh, effects of these interventions during the pandemic for the reasons that have been mentioned before. But I assume that kind of looking back, it's really important because this could be kind of um, moments in that actually can trigger um, a reconsideration of the tools that we have going forward. Um, this was the case, for example, in Italy, where really COVID triggered um, a quite broad reform of the uh, combination of social insurance schemes that can be used during, during the crisis. And even though, I mean, nobody kind of hopes for another pandemic, obviously, to come. Um, in Europe, we have an example of another crisis that actually, um, in a sense, kind of uh, gave, uh, uh, gave us kind of similar challenges, which is the energy crisis. Um, it was obviously not of the same scale, but um, it posed similar challenges that could be addressed, for example, with, with, with schemes that were uh, also used during the pandemic. Thanks, Julia Ruth. As a reporter, I spent a lot of time, besides covering the rollout of these programs, looking in the early days of the pandemic for what we expected to be a massive number of small business failures. And we really didn't see that. I, we saw bankruptcy starting, which is just one measure, because sometimes businesses just close their doors, didn't really start to tick up till this past fall. Um, and anecdotally, I will say I spoke to a lot of small businesses who were helped a lot by these various programs. We can also see that there was a fair amount of money who went to people who either didn't need it or who were, you know, taking money they didn't deserve in a in a more fraudulent manner. So I think there is, you know, somewhat of a mixed bag, but I do know that a lot of small business owners have said their businesses wouldn't be around without the government aid. Okay, so let, uh, let's move to the, you know, one specific program, which we've all mentioned, which is the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, David, if you want to describe what the program was, and then secondly, there's some debate between, I know, between you and Jake, Jake's paper in JCT, um, so Jake's paper in JCT talks about how the P Paycheck Protection Program is actually a progressive program. Uh, and I think if I'm quoting correctly, nearly two thirds of the Paycheck Protection Program money supported worker retention costs. The impacts were progressive. Bottom income quintas increased, eight, uh, increased incomes 18%. Uh, Top quintas increased only 2%. Um, and you also talk about how that was also true of unemployment compensation. Uh, but I think the striking number is about 44% of the Paycheck Protection Program loan forgiveness went to higher income quintiles. Uh, if, if you look at David's paper, the, you know, David, you say that that number, the money that went to higher income folks, it was about 72%. So to the top income. To the top income yeah. Uh, so can we talk about the differences and also just an overview of like, what did the Paycheck Protection Program hope to achieve? Um, why don't we let Jake go first? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the the Paycheck Protection Program was uh, again something that was was the real policy innovation of the CARES Act, and the the motivations and and I think Ruth could be able to speak to some of this as well. But the motivations, uh, at least in the sense of congressional policymakers, were to retain these employer employee relationships, to have workers retain their health insurance because remember we have an employer sponsored health insurance system in the United States. So during a pandemic, if a worker loses their job, they're also potentially losing their health insurance, which is not a great public health thing. Um, and then also to reduce the strain on these state-run, often archaic unemployment insurance programs uh, where they were getting ready to have an influx of, of claimants. And so the idea was the PPP would kind of offset some of that that was going to be generated, both by the, by the expanded uh, generosity and just from the nature of the shock. And, and they wanted to get the dollars out the door quickly. So they used the private lending uh, system to do so. And then they, they guaranteed the loans and eventually forgave something like 95% of the loan mm -hmm. amounts after the fact. There were criteria for, for eligible firms. You were supposed to 
um, at least report that you had less than 500 employees. Uh, uh, and, and there were some other criteria. Loans were capped at about $10 million. Um, and about 60% of the loan amounts were supposed to go to payroll uh, and employee retention costs. I, did I miss anything else that was really important that you can think of? And I think the rules changed over time. Right? And the rules changed yeah. over time. So the, the first draw they issued ended up issuing about $600 billion in loans. The second draw uh, was about $200 billion in loans. And, and that was supposed to be for sw slightly smaller firms, those with less than 300 employees, and you were supposed to have experienced a revenue loss. Mm -hmm. But that was, that was in 2021 as part of the American Rescue Plan. And all the payments to employers were tax deductible, they unlike were, the payments that eventually went to the workers through the program. So yes, workers who, who retained their jobs obviously continued to pay taxes on their wages, but kind of unlike other uh, you know, loan forgivenesses in under the Internal Revenue Code are generally treated as income. And in the case of the PPP, they were not treated as income for, for the entities. Yeah, so that's a, that's a high level overview. I, I can dive into yeah. my paper? Yeah. Okay, so so our paper uh, had, had the benefit of the S, the Small Business Administration released the loans at, the, at like a micro level, individual level loan data. And what we were able to do, because it, at Joint Tax, we have access to uh, uh, tax records. We were able to link those loan applications to the entity level tax returns. And then because most of them were passed through entities, S-Corps or partnerships, we were able to link most of them to the actual owners through the, the K-1s that these entities issued. And we were also able to link them to the workers from the W-2s of the entities. So this provided us with a good measure of the distribution of the workers' wages for PPP firms and a distribution of the owners' wages for the PPP firms and, and allowed us to, to do some of the things that we were interested in doing, which was look at the progressivity, but also look at the wage effects, the, the labor retention effects. And then, uh, you know, we, we, we kind of can't help it. We're at the, the government. We're thinking about the net fiscal cost of this thing. And so we're thinking about revenue feedback mechanisms and other things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so uh, the, Jake's team has done a really good job of this, and we, we didn't have access to the same type of data, yeah. so our uh, calculations are much more back of the envelope. I think we, you know, I actually think they're not that far apart. We sort of calculate that the cost per worker year retained was somewhere between one hundred and one hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars and that some very substantial share of the money ultimately went to the top quintile households. So they estimate about 45% finally, you guess maybe about 75%, but just call it 50%, that's fine. Uh, and uh, a question, you know, a sort of a conceptual question is, is that progressive or regressive, right? So if you, you know, the top quintile of households, they have more than 50% of income. So in that sense, you could say, well, it's progressive, except that this was not a tax cut, mm -hmm. right? It was a, a handout. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the right standard. That is personally, I would say, look, just like the, the UI benefits or the household payments, you know, uh, Equality across uh, income quintiles would be a reasonable expectation. Nobody thought of this as a intentionally trying. And in fact, the payments to workers were capped at one hundred thousand dollars. So Congress intended for it to be progressive in that sense that mm -hmm. people who had incomes above one hundred thousand dollars would not get full replacement, and people who had incomes below didn't. So how did so much end up in the top quintile? It's because only half of it was used for wages, yeah. and so the rest went to owners who are disproportionately affluent. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that. That's you know not a good outcome or not a desirable outcome. But I, I would say uh, I, I, uh, is that there wasn't a, there was no good way to do this, yeah. right? So the choice was between do it badly or don't do it at all. Good was not an option yeah. because the U.S. did not have the administrative infrastructure to actually make payments to workers, unlike uh, many other uh, uh, advanced economies. <laughs> and so, uh, as Julia will speak to, uh, and so it it had to get six hundred billion dollars out the door in the matter of a couple of months. And there was no government capacity, there was no knowledge, there was no administrative infrastructure. There was no way for the government to monitor payrolls and figure out who was getting laid off or who, or even which businesses were uh, in distress. So basically any business that wanted to said we're in distress, they would qualify. And the government couldn't monitor what was happening and it had to use not even government lending facilities, but third party facilities yeah. to do this lending. So it was a complete uh, volunteer fire brigade well, I guess a lot of volunteers ultimately were paid pretty well, but uh, <laughs> so it was, it was a super, you know, you, so you sort of 
sense, it's very useful to understand how where it worked well and where it didn't because you could, would design it differently going forward. And I think mm -hmm. it, it underscores the need for better administrative data, something the used, world used to lead in yeah. and now trails in substantially. Um, but it's, you know, I, if I had to vote up or down for PVP, I would probably vote up. Yeah. And it is true that when people had to apply originally, all they had to do was say, I expect my revenues to go down by, what, 25% over the next few months. Uh, so it wasn't, it was totally vol voluntary sort of reporting. Ruth, you you know you've mentioned that there were lots you know small businesses are a diverse group like it, you know there's no one image of what a small business is. Uh, what do you think the goal of the Paycheck Protection Program was in terms of the types of small businesses you know government wanted to help and what what are your thoughts on did businesses actually get helped by the program? A couple of thoughts. First of all, what is a small business using? Basically, the PPP was based on the SBA's definition of small business, which is fewer than 500 employees, which could mean somebody who's self-employed. It could mean a mom and pop restaurant. It could be a sophisticated software consulting firm or a manufacturer with 450 employees. And those are all different and were different in their ability to access the program. So particularly in the beginning of the program, the businesses that were able to get aid first were the businesses with the deeper banking ties. And if you look at David's paper, he suggests that the take-up rate is lowest in the businesses. I think it was with zero to four employees. And Maybe some of them didn't meet, need the money, but I know in my reporting, what I would hear from people, particularly who worked with like lower income business owners is often they didn't have deep banking relationships. Maybe they got money in the second round when the, 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 the places, the distribution mechanism expanded, but they didn't have those banking relationships. And Many of them didn't have the right kind of paperwork. You know, maybe they wrote their records on a scrap of paper or they didn't have records at all. And I think in designing the program, I, I think when the program first rolled out, there was this notion that, of course, every small business has their personal banker. And that wasn't true. And I think it's important in thinking about these programs to understand sort of just how broad what a small business is. And the other point I'd like to make is, you know, it wasn't clear if this is a program to help small businesses or to help their employees. And those goals both work together and don't work together. So if you're measuring the results per employee saved, I would talk to small business owners, particularly when the rules were more restrictive, who say, they're going to give me money to pay my employees but I have no revenue to pay my rent or my electricity bills. So some of that money wasn't necessarily going into the owner's pocket to pay for consumer goods or whatever they were doing. Some of it was just to pay bills when you didn't have any revenue. So I think there are different ways to think about that. Thanks. Julia, any comments on that? Uh, so I very much agree with what Ruth was emphasizing, the fact that this, the PPP program seems to be kind of uh, combining two goals. One is kind of uh, preserving employment relationships, and the other one is um, supporting businesses. I think there are, uh, in European countries, examples in which these two goals have been um, tackled with separate tools, in particular with job retention schemes for what concerns preserving employment, and with the provision of liquidity through um, loans uh, for uh, basically preserving businesses. And both, I mean, th there's in a sense no point in attempting at preserving relationships if the businesses at the same time cannot be viable in order to basically immediately being able to restore uh, their activity uh, when, uh, I mean, when they can essentially when, say, um, the uh, pandemic restrictions um, uh, were lifted. So I think it's really interesting to think about these two dimensions. For what concerns, I guess, what we were talking about, the progressivity of the schemes, um, having a scheme like again, job retention schemes in which basically the idea is that the government can provide a subsidy for hours not work uh, 
can also introduce a degree of uh, progressivity, at least to the extent to which the replacement rate that is applied is capped at certain levels of earnings. Um, still, I think, I mean, obviously, job retention schemes, unemployment insurance are primarily social insurance schemes that can achieve some redistribution, but their primary objective is an insurance one. Uh, but obviously, I mean, having them uh, designed in a way that um, ensures some redistribution is definitely possible. Thank you. Uh, that kind of gets me to my second question, which is, Early on in the pandemic, we did hear, I know Yelp put out reports saying a lot of small businesses are actually failing. Um, uh, I think there's a Federal Reserve study that says that more than 700,000 establishments closed down in the second quarter of 2020, resulting in nearly 3 million jobs being lost, and nearly half of these were permanent exits. How should we think about these clo closures? You know, a lot of you have spoken about you needed connections, uh, you needed an accountant, you needed to have a bank that you, you know, deal with in order to get the PPP money to fill in the application quickly. You know, I did some interviews of small business owners who had received the P Paycheck Protection Program and a lot of them said, oh, you know, the first round was really hard. Like, luckily we had an accountant because the accountant could help us fill out the forms quickly and apply. So what, what is, uh, I'll start with you, Ruth. Um, how do you think that a lot of businesses actually didn't take up the PPP money? Because originally it was, it was pitched as a loan, right? It's always been considered a loan going from the government to small business owners. And I remember hearing at least anecdotally, a lot of people saying, well, I don't want to be beholden to the government, right? Like I don't want to take a loan from the government and who knows what, you know, what comes with that. Um, so did PPP truly help the businesses that were at the margin or that were that knew they wouldn't be able to survive the pandemic? Wouldn't those have shut down? And then, you know, there's kind of the survivor bias. And I'm just, you know, I'm going to come back to you, Jake and David. What, how does that feed into your analysis, right? Like if, if we're only observing the, the businesses that survived, you know, does that impact how, you know, the results, how, how we should view the results that you get? So I'll start with you, Ruth. Um, so I think for some business, there were some businesses that were going to fail anyways, and these mm -hmm. eight programs just postponed that, that failure. I think for the businesses that didn't take the PPP, I remember doing some reporting in a mm -hmm. low income neighborhood and after, um, the murder of George Floyd, and there were some business owners that weren't even aware that this aid was available. So I think there are you know, particularly on if you were a less sophisticated business with, as I said, poor records, less ties, you might have had a hard time getting that money or 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 knowing about the program. Um, I'll also say I think you know there were closures, there were more reopenings than people thought, and it's hard to distinguish when you look at establishments how many of those are like Starbucks closed this branch rather than it's an actual mm -hmm. mom and pop business that shut its stores permanently. Jake, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, I think that there's, there's kind of like a fundamental trade-off in policy between requiring more paperwork to try and ensure eligibility and decrease fraud and really disproportionately targeting the more sophisticated members of the population that you're trying to give aid to. And this is not just true in the context of the PPP. I think it's true in the context of all sorts of things. Medicaid, uh, the more paperwork, you're really going to be disproportionately hitting the like less literate population, um, even if you're trying to, to target it better. And I think there's some of that that's true that's true here. In terms of the research that David and I did, and, and there's also other two other good papers that, that, that we both cite. Um, by Michael Dalton and then and Eric Zwick and some of his co-authors, this kind of non-random take-up uh, was a real challenge for our collective identification strategies for trying to estimate the effects of these things. So what you really like in, in empirical social science is to have some randomization of who gets it and who doesn't. And there, mm -hmm. there really wasn't that in the PPP. And so we all kind of did different things. The good news is, as David mentioned earlier, is that we all found kind of similar uh, labor share effects. 
And so we think that there, there was an effect on firm closures that, that was positive uh, in the sense that it prevented some firm closures. And there was some effect in terms of workers benefiting from this. And, and the magnitudes are, are kind of imprecise, but, but we are pretty confident collectively that they're there. Yeah, if I can just add to that. I mean, so it's, it's you know, the expectation, the reason PPP was passed was this was thought to be like the small business Armageddon, right? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, we would lose huge numbers of businesses that would not return. That didn't happen, but we don't know how much of that is due to the PPP, some, surely some of it. It's also possible that the effects are even larger than what we know about at the sort of firm level because it created all this liquidity. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, uh, these firms kept going meant more people kept purchasing stuff because their employees were, and so that may have had a kind of a multiplier effect that we, you know, do not, are not able to estimate. Um, now it's, it's also interesting. I mean, two other, you know, points are often raised. Uh, one is this notion of, you know, preserving this, these valuable worker firm relationships. And it's interesting because that the U.S. did that less than any other place, right? Our unemployment rate went to you know 17 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, lots and lots and lots of people turned over, but it's not clear how costly that was in terms of loss of these worker firm relationships, especially because a lot of this turnover was in low-paid jobs where there was really not that much specificity of knowledge. Employers had zero loyalty to their workers. Workers probably had you know epsilon loyalty to their firms, and it created a lot of you know churn after, which actually has been healthy. For the U.S. labor market, and it's actually caused more job shopping and more competition for low-paid workers and services. So it's actually, you know, not many people are fully aware of this. Inequality has fallen dramatically in the United States since 2020. The, you know, we've had 40 years of rising wage inequality, uh, and it, that compressed by one third in the course of, you know, just two and a half years. So uh, that, so it's not clear how much that wisdom about sort of pr preservation of these relationships is sort of uh, has been proven out, it's been demonstrated. And the other thing is also interesting is the US was in a period of falling business dynamism for two decades, fewer and fewer small businesses, new businesses opening, and that also reversed. Mm -hmm. uh, so the whole thing is is full of paradoxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is interesting. But I mean, um, Julia can speak more about this because that, I think you know yeah. her work has really speaks to this question of the value of preservation of these uh, human capital and you know, and the answer may be quite different also uh, in different places. Yes, thank you, David. Yes, indeed. I guess I wanted to sort of uh, touch upon uh, a couple of things that, that have been said. So I think when it comes to selection into take up, and again, this does not only apply to uh, job retention schemes or the PPP, obviously, there is going to always, there's going to be some degree of selection. And I think it's not, that's not a problem per se. It's a problem if uh, the selection is along uh, kind of margins related to information or the inability or the cost to apply. We would rather selection rather to be on the base uh, along the dimension that is, for example, the extent to which a given firm is going to be able to benefit from a program as opposed to kind of just, um, again, rely on it to survive for an extra few months, um, but uh, but not be viable in, in the longer term. So this idea that actually you know, keeping workers attached to firms might uh, reduce the uh, kind of reallocative uh, forces that, uh, that recessions or crises have has been, I mean, has been um, a huge concern, a, a huge policy concern, I would say, especially in Italy, there's, uh, sorry, in Europe, there has been a lot of discussion about that. I mean, we know relatively little, I would say, uh, about the magnitude of the reallocation effects uh, of this scheme or the lack of, you know, the fact that they might end the reallocation. That's what I mean. I've done some work uh, on the Italian context, but during the Great Recession, in which we try to quantify these uh, reallocation effects, and we find that they're relatively small, even though that was a context in which there was a lot of negative selection of firms, because due to the design of the scheme, the Italian job retention scheme, um, low productivity firms, chronically low productivity firms uh, tend to take up the program a lot. I guess the, uh, you know, extrapolating if you want these results to the pandemic is difficult for two reasons. The first is that the pandemic shock was usually, was, was obviously much larger than the Great Recession. So the scope for these kind of 
potential reallocation effect was much larger. But at the same time, the type of shock was more orthogonal in a sense to the previous um, productivity um, levels of firms. And so that would make us basically hope that instead these reallocation effects may have been may have been smaller. Um, so I think, I mean, it's hard to, to make statements, I would say, about that. Um, but um, so, yes, I think it's uh, it's it's difficult. But I would say that that's, I think, what we know from from um, our work and yeah, the papers that are out there. And I'll stick with you, Julia, for, for a second. So, uh, you know, thinking about policies for retaining worker firm attachments, you know, it sounded like the Paycheck Protection Program in the U.S. was very much like an employer subsidy, you know, to retain workers. Um, were there other, like, would there, are there better programs that might have been targeted at employees directly? You know, like in normal times, we do have the earned income tax credit program in the US that says, you know, if you stay employed, you're gonna get, you know, a return. Uh, you'll get some money back from the government at the end of the year, it's a tax credit. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Like, what makes sense in this setting, right? We did it through employers. Yeah. You know, what makes sense in, uh, you know, given your experience with these kind of policies also in Europe? Yeah, I mean, so I guess kind of the uh, the object, the policy object objective in a in a in a situation like the pandemic tends to be of dual. So on the one hand, one one would like to basically stabilize employment and preserve these relationships that, that may be viable, you know, besides kind of the temporary shock. Um, but also on the other hand, kind of provide insurance and in, also in a sense stabilize consumption and stabilize demand. So I think with um, schemes such as the earned income tax credit, for example, or direct payments to workers, um, such as unemployment insurance, you can probably more easily achieve the second. So you can definitely provide insurance, you can hopefully potentially stabilize demand, but you're unable to achieve the first objective, which is the employment stabilization. So I believe that one advantage of the uh, providing kind of the wage subsidy through the firm rather than directly through the through the to, to the workers is that you can really kind of achieve this this dual uh, uh, objective in in that way. Julia, do you want to add to that? I I just there may be another objective that you have as well, which is what do you want the makeup of your economy to really look like? So. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that small businesses were more vulnerable than larger than big corporations to the impact of economic shocks like the pandemic. They have smaller cash reserves. They can move more quickly, but they tend to be more fragile. So in addition to sort of thinking about those employer employee relationships, if if lots of small businesses fail, you know, then you may have a more concentrated economy and that's another policy choice that I think people have to think about. David, Jake. Go ahead. Why don't you go ahead? <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, you know, I mean, you know, one thing that Julia alluded to is uh, for these, you know, what are called short-time work, which is you know, mm -hmm. very common in Europe and exists in the US but is rarely used, is the notion that you can reduce someone's hours uh, and the government will make up the difference, right? So you cut someone's pay in half, uh, or you cut their hours in half, and then the, uh, they, so they work half time, but the government steps in and pays the other half, or two thirds of the other half, or something like that. And the advantage of that is that it means that the employer is uh, only will, uh, they basically have to, it, it's, it induces virtuous selection, right? That you wouldn't want to do this, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to, uh, take up this money if you weren't actually going to reduce your employer's hours. So if you're a big firm, right, you can, you know, you could just take the money and not lay anyone off, not, you know, or, or lay them off ultimately, actually. <laughs> it's up to you because ultimately there were so many safe harbors that were created yeah. after the policy was put in place that any firm that took the money, even if it didn't use it for payroll, could essentially say, well, some other law prevented us from doing that. It would have put people at risk. So we fired all our workers and we're keeping the money. And that was legal, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it, it eventually became, you know, in some sense, it was initially supposed to be a conditional transfer and ultimately became an unconditional transfer. Uh, and, you know, uh, so that was, uh, and that was the result of lobbying, right? And lobbying by big firms and big firms loved PPP 
and you know that's how we got a third round of PPP, and that's how they got you know this eighty billion dollar tax expenditure to make it all tax free for mm -hmm. everyone who got it, and then had these multiple rounds of safe harbors added that essentially made it uh, you know the money was never going to come back, and and I think that was unfortunate, and that's a you know but that's a that's the nature of our politics. It's very very susceptible to lobbying. I think you know I if. If I were had access to Jake's data and I was allowed <laughs> to do it by my employer, which I, I'm sure I wouldn't be, that you could do a, the the horror stories you could tell from the tax data about firms. Like, like Jake looks away <laughs> from about you know. Jake it, is trying to stay apolitical. Yeah, <laughs> uh, employed. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly. Stay employed. I mean, exactly. You would be able to see this, right? Firms that got absolutely you promised enormous you payments, wouldn't have that goal. <laughs> reported what normally would be enormous profits, but didn't pay taxes on that, right? And had very little worker. Pay. That would all be visible in corporate tax returns. So you could tell the story. And that doesn't mean the program was yeah. terrible and net, but there were amazing abuses, right? So, you know, hotels uh, closed down, fired all their workers, uh, used it to break unions. Uh, and then when they came back, the jobs were worse. And they kept all that money, even though they didn't retain their employees, because they said, well, the other pandemic restrictions prevented us from doing it. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, the Ramadas of the world. And so there are a lot of, you know, big corporations and big pass through businesses that got just enormous handouts. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that was, you know, uh, no one can feel good about that. And, and the designers of the program, except the people who got the money, and the designers of the program didn't intend that. And, you know, it, but there were, it, so you could have done better. You couldn't yeah. have done perfectly. We don't have the administrative systems. You know, all, of, all you know, Italy and, and most of uh, Western Northern Europe, right, have detailed registers at the worker firm level so they can see payments maybe not in in, in real time mm -hmm. right but they can figure out who was paid and who was working and all that we don't have that so going going back to the the piece about worker um <coughs> subsidies <coughs> versus employer subsidies before i talk about verification so the, the united states has tried uh you know the advanced earned income tax credit was was a part of the tax code in the 2000s yeah. There was a very low take up. It's very difficult to administer because it depends on things like uh, how many dependents you have uh, and, you know, how much labor income you're having. And, and a lot of these things are more difficult to forecast for tax units within a year than you would guess. House low income households just have less, more variability in their income. Their, their household structure changes over the course of the year more. And so it, it's very tough to then have the IRS go in and say, okay, you were given the advanced DITC, but actually you didn't qualify. Now we're going to take it back. Yeah. It's, it's both like not politically a great thing to do and also administratively pretty tough. So I think that, that for better or worse, doing this through the individual side outside of things like UI benefits and stimulus checks, I think it's pretty difficult to do administratively. In terms of the verification, I think that I hope one of the lessons that was learned by by policymakers uh, is, is that they really do need to think about what do they already see on these tax returns. Uh, you know, in addition to entity level tax returns, you have quarterly employment filings, Form 941. What do you already see on there that you can use as a way to verify that who is taking it is actually somebody who's eligible, and then after the fact. Mm -hmm. verify that they uh, complied with the rules in a way that doesn't require new reporting and in a way that you can actually see. Mm -hmm. And there's just, there's a hostility to data collection in the United States that's nefarious, right? People are constantly trying to undermine the, the Internal Revenue Service, even though the best evidence is those collection dollars have a very high rate of return. And it's not because they're, you know, uh, you know, busting down the doors of the houses of widows uh, reclaiming social security payments, right? It's billionaire tax cheats. Uh, but, you know, the, there's, the rhetoric is, this is the government, is the IRS overreaching. The reality is Congress members are influenced by wealthy people who don't want to pay taxes. And then there's another mindset of we can't have those jack suited government thugs coming in uh, and knowing, you know, uh, what we're paying. And so, the, you know, so we've, there, there's just been enormous political pushback against centralized data collection. You know, the unemployment insurance system in the United States, right, it's 50 different archaic systems. Yep. And yet they're all, mo a lot of that money comes from the federal government. And all those records actually go back to the federal government. Ultimately, yeah. they form the LEHD, which, you know, Longitudinal Employment Household Dynamics Database that some of you might have used or may yeah. use uh, if you're so fortunate uh, later on in life. And uh, <laughs> the, um, and so, but still, the, so this would be the moment to centralize that, to say we ought to federalize that system, right? Every system, you know, these, the reason everyone got 600 bucks as opposed to, there is because these systems were written in COBOL 
19, yeah. in the 1950s, the number of COBOL programmers remaining alive is smaller than the number of people in this room. So they could not reprogram them in real time. So yeah. they just, just added checks, right? Uh, yeah. And so, you know, this will be the moment that people are going to say, oh my God, you know, this is just a, this is a, you know, a derelict system. Let's centralize and the government will do this. Uh, but there is enormous hostility mm -hmm. towards that. Uh, so I, I, it's unfortunate that it's not just underinvestment, it's malevolent neglect mm -hmm. uh, that has put us in this situation. I'd say also one of the issues with for data collection was we know so little about small businesses that even questions like how many businesses were closing or how hurt businesses were, were very difficult to determine. And you had during the pandemic, as we were going along, a lot of economists trying to look at alternative sources of data just to get a read on what was happening in the yeah, I mean, a lot of the real-time data came from the private sector, That's right? True. I, I exactly. worked with ADP, the payroll provider, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, Raj Chetty and the crew, crew at Opportunity yeah. Insights, they put stuff together from paychecks, from uh, a variety of uh, credit card companies trying to get this kind of real-time tracker what was going on. In other countries, they would just look at the, the dashboard in their, in their yeah. office, but uh, exactly. yeah. And that brings me to, I think you mentioned short term, uh, short term work um, policies. Julia, if you want to talk about how that's working out in Europe, is it a data issue? Like, you know, David's saying, well, you know, we just don't collect enough. We don't know actually employees in the US are not documenting hours. Uh, like what's the challenge with, yes, this is working great in, you know, in a lot of European countries, but it's not something that it's less than 5% take up in the US, I, I, I think. Sure enough, yeah, yeah, very rare. Right? Um, yeah. So, um, so my understanding of the reason why short-time work may not be as popular, let's say, in the U.S., is not that. I mean, it do, it does exist. In more than more than yeah. half of the of U.S. states have an operating short-time work, short-time comp. It's called short-time compensation or work sharing uh, in the U.S. But they have these type of schemes. So, um, kind of my understanding is that there are two reasons why these are not mm, very. Uh, uh, I mean, they're not really used by firms. The first is related to information. And here there's also uh, academic evidence that this is actually the case. There is work by uh, Susan Hausman and co-authors that basically um, uh, as, as, as shown that a lot of um, a lot of businesses are unaware of the existence of these schemes. And once informed about the schemes, they're kind of more prone to, to rely on them. So there is an element related to information. And the second, apparently, also to administrative hurdles. Uh, the fact that, again, it's a system that is probably not so automated yet. And so um, uh, firms, employers who want to apply have to fill kind of long firms and wait for long approval times. And so this tends to discourage, uh, to discourage firms from using it. I would also like to emphasize another aspect, which um, may be a, heterogeneous in the US context. It's so also in other countries, including those that newly introduced the scheme during the pandemic, which is related to the uh, type, kind of the extent to which the scheme allows for our uh, for flexibility in hours reductions. In countries like Germany or Italy, for example, you can reduce the number of hours um, down to zero, but you can choose to reduce it by less. Um, just to give a counter example to that, the, uh, the first coronavirus job retention scheme that was introduced in the UK was much stricter in that dimension. So it didn't really allow uh, a lot of flexibility to firms. So, so I think that's probably also another dimension that, you know, when, when kind of a scheme comes with, uh, with a set of constraints, it might be less appealing to firms. Um, so this is kind of my view of what uh, what is probably the reason uh, why the scheme uh, is is less is less used in the US. In the US, of course, at the beginning of the pandemic, and this came up already, I think, um, uh, in what has been said, um, governments and local governments had to had to react very quickly, and so I think administrative considerations. Um, we're obviously kind of uh, of first order uh, at that point. So it's probably kind of, I don't know, again, I, I tend to share kind of what David said before, that it's hard kind of to think back and say, you know, what was, uh, whether we should have done it differently because it was such a unique kind of uh, situation. 
but going forward, probably it's useful. I mean, it's definitely useful to think about alternatives. If anyone, Ruth, you want to comment on FTC schemes? Great. Okay. Um, the other question I had was about the interaction between unemployment compensation in the US and the Paycheck Protection Program. At least initially, you were not allowed to claim both. So as an employee, you could either get the, the support from your employer to stay employed and get you know maybe 60% of what you were making before. Uh, but, um, you, but with unemployment insurance, you could actually make more than 100% of what you were making on your job. And so how did that impact incentives and why was it structured? You know, why was it structured like that? And I think it gets to what you were saying, David, that states just could not, you know, I, I remember at CEA, we, we actually talked to a lot of the state workforce agencies and they were like, there's no way we can target a replacement rate. Like, give us a flat sum, let the federal government pay for it, <laughs> you know, the, the top up. But, um, you know, it just seemed to me always like it was, you know, at loggerheads with each other, these two policies. I mean, it, yeah, the, 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 the pandemic unemployment insurance system was more than just generous. It also expanded to many, many people who weren't previously qualified, including people who had too few hours, who, were, uh, who worked in gig jobs and so mm -hmm. on. So it was really... It was a very successful program in many ways, yeah. uh, and it, it was extremely progressive because the replacement rate was much higher for lower wage workers. There was a lot of fraud. There was a mm -hmm. lot of fraud in PPP as well. I think the only program that didn't have fraud was the household checks, right? Or not much of it because uh, that, that is sort of known from tax data yeah. what the households are. Um, the, uh, you know, it's, it's a, people have looked very long and hard to find the, you know, the kind of employment discouragement effect you would expect from mm -hmm. an unemployment insurance scheme that was that generous, and they've turned up very little of it. Right, uh, you know, Peter Ganon and co-authors have mm -hmm. worked on this. I actually worked on this too, and I, I have an unwritten paper that uh, shows that you know that when the the scheme ended, there was a big, there was a spike in reemployment, and a lot of small businesses opened the day that reopened the day this scheme ended. But I don't think it, it wasn't nearly as distortionary. There were lots and lots of stories about you know restaurants couldn't hire anyone because their workers say, "Why would I work for you? I'm making twice as much by not working for you." I don't think we found a lot of representative evidence to say that this was a huge factor. So these these programs, uh, and, and as, as Jake's paper, paper points out, right, the PPP, one way it actually saved money was that people who were receiving it couldn't go on UI. They were still working, yeah. right? So there was, a, there was a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of uh, cross, uh, what, one program sort of reduced program costs on the other. It, although I, I will say, and this is something that, that David actually helped us to, to refine our, our estimates of this. So one of the things we do in the paper is estimate the amount of unemployment insurance saved as a result of the PPP. And kind of the, the first thing that we discovered when we were going to match up, uh, because of course we, we've linked the workers to the PPP firm, we can then go look at those workers' uh, receipt of UI through the 1099G. And the thing that jumped out at us was how much UI uh, workers at PPP firms had in fact received. Is that so, right? Yeah, so, so in our paper, we actually estimate that the UI effect is, is pretty small. We think it only uh, reduced the cost of the PPP by about 6%. Um, so, so actually the, the pattern of UI take up among PPP uh, employees versus non is, is Pretty similar, and I think that this goes back to that you were mentioning the, the safe harbors and the enforcement decisions that were made. Um, right. So after all those hotels could have taken PP, fired all their workers, yeah. and and rehired them even. Right. right. It could be that they just temporarily said, right. "You go off this. This is more generous." The the replacement rate. I have a paper with Jeff Jeff Laramore and David Splinter that measures the UI replacement rates, yeah. uh, and we find that that for a lot of workers it was above 100%. Yep. And so, in in some sense, it, it could have been a, a a rational thing for these employees to do to go on yeah. unemployment insurance for a couple of months. Then the hotel hires them back, and they've actually gotten more income, and it's not taxable. Uh, because unemployment insurance was also excluded from taxable income up to ten thousand dollars. So, uh, so you think that if, even if they were on temporary layoffs, you, a lot of them claimed UI, though technically they shouldn't have. Uh, it's unclear. It's, so the onus was not on the worker, right, yeah. for the PPP. So if the worker gets laid off, they can go claim yeah. unemployment insurance. The the PPP, PPP was about the business. Was about, yeah. So this is all on the on the business side, not on the yeah. not on the worker side. That's true. Yeah. Ruth, do you want to speak to that? Um, 
I would only say you would hear a lot of employers talking about how hard it was to find workers. And so one of the stories people would tell was because they had all these benefits. It's hard to know if that's the case or if people, you know, were not returning to jobs because of health concerns, because mm -hmm. they had, you know, other family members to take care of, if they had rethought their priorities. And it, it, it felt murky in terms of being able to sort of prove what was actually the case. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. Sorry. No, no, go on, me. David. Well, I just want to say, I mean, what's amazing is how much we have recovered from this yeah. and the Western world has recovered from this. I mean, fortunately it was not nearly as severe in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and India mm -hmm. and even in China. So we don't know how fast they would have recovered. But you know, I, I find it remarkable. I mean, whenever, you know, whenever you hear about like, you know, JetBlue has a computer failure, they have to cancel 2,000 of their flights, so there's no storm. <laughs> we think, well, that's it, they're done. Like they'll never get it back together. It just seems impossible, <laughs> they should go out of business. And, and you might've thought we also should go out of business, yeah. right? Because our systems were so disrupted, right? We stopped going to work. Uh, our supply chains broke down. Uh, you know, our medical system was totally taxed. We st we spent twenty percent of GDP right in transfer program. You might have thought uh, we'll never come back, mm -hmm. right? It's just it's too complicated, and it's amazing how resilient. And I think Julia alluded to this earlier as well during the energy crisis caused by the Ukraine war. It's amazing how resilient Europe has been to that huge cost shock. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if there's a I think there's a meta lesson in that. I don't have a more specific one, but it's I'm I'm uh, impressed by it. Yeah, <laughs> all our worst ideas didn't actually pan out. All our worst worries didn't pan out. Um, Julia, did you want to respond to it? Well, I just a couple of very small thoughts. So the first is that um, uh, kind of related to the initial part of the discussion in which uh, you were we were discussing about kind of the contemporaneous use in a sense of the wage subsidy and unemployment insurance is that in thinking about job retention scheme, one could, uh, in, in those contexts, it's possible to introduce pro a prohibition of dismissal, a clause that prohibits lay layoffs, which is, by the way, what has been done during, during the pandemic um, in Europe. So it could be kind of a, uh, a way to, to tackle, in a sense, that, uh, that potential uh, kind of moral hazard problem. Um, and the second is that maybe I would like to, you know, given at least from a kind of a European perspective, there's been really kind of a lot of emphasis on this uh, worry that short-term work could in, would impose very, very uh, large reallocation effects. Well, given what we just said, if unemployment insurance is especially uh, generous, it can also have reallocation effects just of a different type in the sense that probably short-term work is more of a break to uh, kind of the reallocation of capital, labor and capital towards say different sectors, but um, a very generous UI I can have very much, yeah, very similar uh, implications for the reallocation of labor, the lack of reallocation of labor, or I mean, in the sense that it's going to slow it down. Thanks. And that tees up, uh, you mentioned moral hazard. Ruth, you've written a lot about the employee retention tax credit, uh, you know, that. I feel like we're hearing it on the news all the time. You know, help, we can help you get your ER, you know, ERC dollars. And I know you had a recent news story. Uh, let me see. Yeah, the, uh, the credit has already cost the government at least $230 billion. The IRS says it has initiated 330 criminal investigations involving more than $2.8 billion of potentially fraudulent ERC claims. That, and then we also saw that the Paycheck Protection Program, you know, the um, sort of loan forgiveness rates are well above 90%. What sort of moral hazard did these programs create? And how, you know, how do we address that? How do we think about that going forward? What could we do differently going forward? Well, I think one of the things that happened in each of these programs is there's a tension between getting money out quickly and getting it to the right people. And so, you know, in things like the PPP or there was a disaster loan program specific yes. to COVID, some of the checks started coming in. By checks, I mean not the checks that are going out to pay people, but fraud checks and all of that. Those things people started thinking about later. And, you know, the idea was to get money out as fast as possible. In the case of the employee retention tax credit, which uses the tax system as a way to 
get money out. The laws were written very vaguely. The IRS, rather than putting out a lot of prescriptive rules, um, did a little bit of question and answers, but there was an effort to get money out really fast and that opened the door for fraud. Um, and so I think that's something you have to think about in these programs. Yes, folks here for the second one? Yes, I think we should turn to, we have um, about... Yeah, we have about 15 minutes actually, yeah. Yeah, I was yeah, just so, seeing the room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Aline Bertoli. I'm a former Max Weber fellow, and actually now I am a senior uh, fellow at uh, the Institute of International Economic Law at Georgetown. I'm spending a semester here as an independent researcher, and I was just wondering um, if the, because I keep hearing like monitoring, you know, uh, diagnosing, determining, data, 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 right? Uh, so now the tools that we have at hand, uh, they are changing the game. Like if you were to have another Armageddon, things would be different. Or the problem is rather regulation because for a long, long time, we've been discussing that uh, private privacy, it's not more a matter of, uh, you know, how individuals uh, react. Like it's pretty much like we surrender our rights to privacy, but uh, firms on the other hand, they still are very much uh, protected. So regulations perhaps prevent the government to actually monitor and you know uh, delve into what happened, what what why we're dealing with so much fraud because household payments they didn't have that much of a problem, right? Mm -hmm. But we see this tremendous amount of uh, um, uh, criticism regarding these other two branches of uh, of the program. So is data problem or regulations are the problem? I mean, it, it's probably, it's a mix of those two, right? Um, now, the, it, it does seem as though uh, reg writers made a conscious choice regarding the in, enforcement, right? And then the kind of politics surrounding clawing back some of these these benefits during the pandemic, I think were, were not great. And so deliberately kind of took a hands-off approach on, on enforcement uh, through regulations. On the data side, you know, as, as David had alluded to, the one thing that, that is really lacking in, in US administrative data is data that is more contemporaneous. So we have these like annual filings for most individuals, and then we have quarterly payroll filings, but nothing on like a, a narrower timeline than that. And, and the pandemic really highlighted, given how quickly things were changing on a month for month basis, that kind of lack uh, and that hole in the system in terms of having a monthly or weekly data series to understand. And, and Ruth alluded to this as well regarding small business closures is it, something that is, is going to be, if Armageddon happened again tomorrow, that's still our, that's still our system, right? Uh, so that hasn't been changed or fixed, uh, but maybe in, in the future, uh, at least on the business side, it's something that, that people could consider. In the case of the employee retention- AI changed the, the situation? Not, in, not without enough cameras and drones, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, China has, a, has much better, you know, knowledge of what all its population is doing, but it has, much more monitoring infrastructure. Uh, so the US, you know, we don't have those systems. So it's not that we didn't have the, it wasn't for lack of capability to crunch the data. We simply didn't have the information in any centralized way. I was gonna say, in the case of the employee retention credit, um, to claim the credit, businesses would file an, amend an amended tax return. And one of the issues that's made it very hard for the IRS is they try to figure out which which claims are questionable and which ones are fraudulent and which ones are not, was that you didn't have to put down even basic information when you were filing it. So you didn't have to say, here, I'm claiming it for this reason or provide, I'm not talking about like a detailed analysis, but you didn't even have to provide the basics that they could use if they wanted to look at like a certain batch of claims 
and see if there were there was more fraud in there. And that wasn't, I don't think regulation present, prevented them from doing it. They just did, you know, it didn't happen in this case. Every time the United States or any other, any other country goes to war, it experiences these problems. Um, so we know that there are going to be problems when we have a challenge like this. You've uh, mentioned, and I think it's very important to say, we live in a surveillance state in which an enormous amount of data is collected on all of us, but the government is not the one who's right. doing yeah. the collecting. Why on a simple level could there not be legislation that said under declared emergency conditions, the government shall have access to sets of data controlled by ADP, controlled by the banks, uh, contr controlled by the realtors, I mean, there's there's an enormous. I mean, American marketing can tell you how many chocolate bars were sold in a zip code on an almost instantaneous basis. And why not use federal power to uh, let the private sector continue at its own cost, collect this information, but have the right of the government in a case of emergency intervene with that data and mandate ADP and the others to do a lot of the work. Yeah, I mean, the, the government statistical agencies increasingly work with private sector data providers for this. They, they think their future is not big surveys. Uh, and, uh, and so I think, you know, I think you could, I mean, still, it would be a challenging job to integrate if you hadn't planned for that. But, I, but like, look at how much, uh, you know, debate there is about reorganizing FISA, the right, the Foreign uh, uh, something Surveillance Act. Uh, and you know, where the government is supervised by a court to ask for phone records, the calls in out. So right, the, the CIA and the FBI right now are, there's a wall between them that prevents them uh, from you know, figuring out things that are happening outside the country that will affect things inside the country. And this is you know, very contentious. So uh, I do think th there's, so there's benign neglect and there's malign neglect. This is more ideological and not necessarily in a bad way. Uh, but there's a very strong counter reaction in the United States to any kind of centralization of uh, monitoring. But I agree, we live in a private sector surveillance state. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, Anna? Oh, yeah. Hi, Anna Shervina. A very interesting panel. So I have a slightly different question. I remember during the pandemic, a lot of people spoke out against any kind of government intervention. They said some businesses should fail, they don't have any future. And uh, well, I'm glad that the government didn't really listen to them. But I wonder if anybody has done any analysis. So David has mentioned that actually the new business creation has increased in some way. And I remember my friend was doing research and it was surprised, he was surprised to find that the new business creation was slowing down in some states. So did anybody or has anybody looked into how the composition of small businesses has changed as a result of the pandemic? And if indeed the businesses that should have failed, they indeed failed because they didn't have the capacity to apply for those programs because they just didn't have done. So, so there's a, there's a, th this data series I think David is alluding to that uses uh, Form SS4, which is an application for an employee identification number that the census has created this business formation uh, data series. And, and Ryan Decker and co-authors at, uh, he, he's at the Fed, have have examined the the reasons supporting this. I don't know that that there's like a clear story to be told regarding why this has happened. I mean, so so when I was thinking of the PPP uh, in, in the context of the pandemic, I was thinking, well, it, it makes sense to retain these businesses here because it's not like their business model failed. We had a pandemic happen. Uh, you know, this is an, an, a shock and it was nothing about that, that this was not a sustainable business model, unlike, say, some of the businesses that might have failed during the Great Recession that you might think that, well, they were overextended or some other fault of their own. So because otherwise in a normal downturn, you think of like Joseph Schumpeter, creative destruction, you know, you have businesses that go because they really do need to go. And here that wasn't the case. And, and I think it is a genuine puzzle, and, and I don't know if, if any of you have, have any sense either of why business formation has taken off afterwards, other than perhaps the, the liquidity that was available in a broad sense uh, as a result of all the transfers. I think that's a really complicated question, and that data set measures like that first step that you would take, which is to get an employer identification number and 
you know, we're starting to see that turn into some more firms, but we don't know yet exactly how what that relationship is going to going to look like. And there seems to be some difference in the data between sort of the firms that were created or the employer identification numbers that were were gotten in the first year of the pandemic when people were home, more people were home and they may have been bored and it may be different for the second year. And I think one of the challenges goes back to this data collection um, problem, which is what one of the reasons this data set became important is because a lot of the data we have just lags so much or it or doesn't tell us what we want to know. My understanding is that the new small businesses were forming were not all tech firms and not all in Silicon Valley. So that's a change, right? That actually they were in different places mm -hmm. and in different sectors. So suggesting some of it was a kind of dynamic response to changing circumstances. Like if you look at patent data, there was this huge spike in patents of technologies that were useful for work from home, right? And so you do, I mean, this is, the virtue of a market system, right? You do see a lot of people attempting to innovate in response to change circumstances. And you saw a lot of non-store retail in that first mm -hmm. period right after the pandemic, um, which is like one of those responses to I'm home and what can I do? I just have a very hopefully quick question, but and it's along the lines of some of the things we've been talking about just here at the end, but um, when I know you weren't directly involved in the policy formation, you're just, you know, you're terrific academics and knowledgeable people trying to evaluate these things ex post to some extent. But was what's your knowledge of in the formation of these policies, there was clarity of what the end state was that we were trying to achieve. And then how do you think about like, how much are we willing to just kick the can down the road? And how much of it do we really want to restructure the economy in some way? Kind of those kinds of questions. And I'm thinking like along the lines of the business formation, type one, type two errors. Like we want to make sure we're kind of helping companies that should be sustained be sustained. Mm -hmm. But we also don't want to make type two errors where we're, you know, giving money to, pe to firms that really don't have an effective business model when you look at it out through time. Given the conversation about administrative data, I'm delusional if I think the information existed to actually think about that systematically. Um, but do you have any thoughts about just how the policy formation discussion occurred? So, uh, JCT is, uh, uh, you know, was participating in a, a lot of the, the policy discussions. And so that I, Keep with the <laughs> disclaimer, which I probably should have said at the beginning, that nothing I say represents the opinions of the Joint Committee on Taxation or any <laughs> member of Congress. Oh, but uh, <laughs> I say this is like off the record. Yeah, it covers, like covers the whole uh, whole talk. To be clear, um, you know, it, it it was less of a we have a set of very specific goals that we want to achieve, and more here's a crisis, what can we do yeah. to mitigate it? And, and you know, we, we were on hours and hours of calls, uh, brainstorming, trying to think of, you know, how do you address kind of all the topics that have been talked about today? And, and I, I really don't think that policymakers had a sense of three years past, this is what we wanna tweak the lever to hit a certain outcome. It was more, there's a fire, how do we do what we can to mitigate the effects of the fire? And my sense, you know, being also sort of having some visibility into what was going on was really like, what can people come together and agree on, right? And it wasn't so much, or, you know, Republicans want to do this at the start of the pandemic. Later, I think by July, when the economy kind of came back, you know, then there were more divergent, you know, viewpoints about should we extend UI supplements or not. But at the beginning in March and April, it was just like, everyone seemed to be talking with one voice, right? Let's spend more money out. We can't target. We, you know, there's no way to figure out, you know, bank account information or who's below a certain income or which small businesses, you know, what their revenues are going to look like. It's just like send money out. Here's a short term solution. It's going to go away in four months. You know, that's all we need to deal with. So it, it was a lot of short termism, at least from, you know, my That, that may be, I'm not being critical. I mean, that may be the yeah. right way to approach a problem like that. Uh, I just am curious kind of as somebody sitting there saying, 
where is this taking us? And I, I try not to look at that out point, over an extended Vince yeah. And as a reporter covering the rollout of the PPP, I would say that they were building the car while they were driving it down the yeah, road. Exactly. And that, that we would get up every day and look to see if Treasury had added new guidance. And I would be talking to lenders who were charged with making these PPP loans and like the program was rolling out and there were still things they didn't know or it changed, you know, a week later. So I think there was a lot of work being done on the fly. I mean, it was an unprecedented situation, um, but this idea that, that the policymakers had the foresight to sort of understand all the ramifications and tweak it that way. It just didn't feel like that was what was going on in real time. I mean, this could, it, it, this is really like probably politically very boring for people to think about, but the thing we could be doing now is thinking about some of the things like Richard was saying, or some of the administrative data considerations so that we at least have informed decisions. Um, totally. It depends, it depends on generating dozens of war plans and yeah. security, right. but dozens of contingencies. Why are they looking at treasury to fail with some combination? It's a contingency plan. It doesn't have to be what we will do, but it offers a menu. Menu of options. Right. Well, and having the data to support some of those decisions real time, because it was clear that you didn't have the data you needed real time to kind of make a, make the I mean, best people, choices. Exactly. People thought the CDC was, we were the best prepared country. In terms of, <laughs> I you know. know disease control. But I mean, it was believed up until that moment. I mean, it wasn't true, but you know, we thought we had the plan. Yeah. Uh, although I will say, you know, for all of the, you know, there's so many shortcomings and I, I know I can be criticized for being too optimistic, but it, it did show the efficacy of government, right? Actually, that there was no private sector firm. Google wasn't going to step, step in and spend 20% of GDP to fix this, right? And it did, you know, child poverty fell to its lowest level in US history. Uh, you know, houses didn't go bankrupt, people mm -hmm. weren't thrown out on the streets, right? It could have been like Hoovervilles, you know, after 1929 you know, or something, and it wasn't. Uh, so it was actually in many, many ways, not only a success in terms of how we adapted to it, but a demonstration that there still actually is not a close substitute for government uh, in dealing with some of these major problems. I'd be interested to hear Julia's perspective on how this is perceived or, you know, whether, you know, it, uh, Italy or any other country to which you're most familiar felt like it did enough, too much, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. So on, on this point, I think, I mean, views are obviously uh, very heterogeneous and yeah. you know, the, there's obviously political considerations, but maybe kind of to end in a sense or add a positive note to, to this, the discussion that we have just been, that we have been doing. Um, I think it's, I think it has like the, the the pandemic has really proved as um, kind of a, a context in which governments have been rethinking about these schemes. And again, I'm more familiar with the Italian one, but I can tell you that again, the the, the crisis really accelerated a reform that is was uh, a reform of all the social insurance schemes that was long uh, needed. And that provided kind of, you know, we had a system that was highly fragmented, didn't provide kind of coverage to certain subgroups of workers and the population. And so in a sense, I think, you know, there, there was, uh, it was really a momentum to rethink about these schemes. And in some contexts, this, this has been done. Again, the Italian one is an example. We had the reform of the short-time work scheme that integrates also um, unemployment insurance. Um, so yes. I think there is there is also it was also like a, a positive uh, moment for policy. I mean that's partially I didn't I, I realize we're out of time so I'm gonna that's partially why I was raising the question about the in-state right because even in its like I was executive dean of the Kennedy School at the time right with the financial crisis and you had a choice and many parts of Harvard just said well we should take an across the board cut X percent endowment payouts down all of that. And our, David Elwood was the dean at the point, and, and he and I talked about it. And I said, look, from my, I was in the private sector for a long time. We would use this as a strategic opportunity. Is it bad? Yes. OK. But it's a real strategic opportunity to say, let's pick programs that we think are critical to our mission and the, those that are less critical. And we will, we will 
use this as an opportunity, even though it's painful, it's an inflection point where we can make these strategic changes, right? And that's why I was, I, you know, I understand the crisis. You can't really do that in a crisis all the time. But was there any thinking about strategically, how can we rethink? And Julia, it sounds like you did. I mean, you're using it to rethink social insurance programs and, and other kinds of social programs. Yeah, I mean, the U.S., I think the rate of unlearning is as fast as the rate of that's learning, what, right? That's what worries me, yeah. That's <laughs> part know, of why, so you know, we need to have this history that's occurring, yeah. Right? Uh, so uh, that's the concerning part, yeah. the sort of the motivated reasoning that gets us to, you know, the, the, you know, the incredible success of the, uh, the COVID vaccine was actually a government plot and, uh, you know. <laughs> exactly. I mean, not as much of a plot as Taylor Swift. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and how it does, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I don't want to sound cynical because I thought his comment about resilience actually worked out that we so much better than I mean, yeah, okay, thank okay. you so much on that positive note. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you.